Good to have you back for what happens to be our 186th episode of ThinkTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And we're ongoingly looking for a more free way to live on our islands of Hawaii. And for that, we have our utmost expert, Fry Otto. Fry means free and free means fry. And his long-term collaborator, Larry Medlin, back in Tucson, Arizona, in the uh, Rapalis studio. Welcome back, Larry. Nice to be here again. Good to have you back. And let's go. Yeah, we're on the first slide here. And uh, the top row we've been uh, concluding with uh, last time uh, that amazingly, you guys in this little uh, Bauhausian Berlin box with little soap bubble and uh, single and double multiple loop models, you basically made it to represent my native country of Germany uh, in its most important representation on the World Fair in 1967. And then soon after that, uh, half a decade, Fry was jumping to the other most representative typology that a country can have, and that is an Olympic stadium. And we're going to touch on that briefly. And similarly, you know, we just called the run at the very top left the hideous Hitler high rise on the 1936 World Fair in Paris. And then there were the uh, Olympics um, around the same year, actually a year before, I believe, down there. This is the Berlin Stadium that later on pretty much have been um, remodeled recently by the architect uh, Gerkan American partner. You'd see at the very bottom right. And guess what? They have put a canopy over it and it has some fabrics on it. The little row of pictures on top of there, one, uh, we've been talking about Fry's Arctic project last time, Larry, and the material specification was supposed to be double layer translucent pillows. And some three decades later, that made it into the mainstream of architecture. The little uh, blue bubble there uh, is a reference to a show DeSoto and I did where I was sharing that project we did for mentally disabled children in 2002, where we covered some parts with uh, what we know ever since as ETFE. And some three years later, Herzog de Moran did uh, that stadium in Munich that is both red and blue for different soccer teams. And uh, again, it just proves how much ahead of the game you guys were and that what was mainstream and envisioned and utopian at that time made it into real life architectural um, application big times. So go to the next slide, because we're going to quickly talk about that, that Olympic project here is a little lot on this one slide here, but start on the very uh, top left there. Um, this is basically the um, uh, Fry as what we read, you know, was as an early child fascinated by Zeppelins and airplanes. And um, I, I should go back quick to the, to the ETFE. Basically, we, um, the company we worked with in 2002 was Foil Tech, and the competitors was Kappa Tech. And Kappa Tech then ran bankrupt over the uh, Herzog de Moron Munich Stadium. And so unfortunately, uh, did uh, this is the Bodensee up there. And um, who was uh, having his, his firm, uh, his company at the Bodensee, Larry? Peter Strohmeyer. And we see him where? At the very top left. He's sitting there uh, at this conference that you guys yeah, uh, you know, were all at. Conference for uh, uh, the special portion of special research area. Yeah. Spezial um, portion. It was, but he was there to the, all, every one of those in that series. Yeah. And uh, once again, he unfortunately got into some trouble after your pavilion. So once again, you know, innovation takes its toll, but it's still worth it. It needs these pioneers, right? And that's what you guys truly were. And the second half right side of this here is dedicated to his collaborator on this project here. And we've been talking about my dad, Günther, and he's holding this book here uh, proudly. And this is the big uh, encyclopedia of world architecture that he represents his hometown of Hanover together with the other Günther, and that's Günther Benisch. And Günther Benisch and Fry Otto share something because both had to serve in the World War. 
Uh, uh, however, uh, Fry was up there in the air uh, in the Luftwaffe, and uh, Günther Benisch was down there in a submarine. And you know, if a uh, little trip uh, recommendation at the very bottom right is a museum right outside of my door here at the uh, Starnberger See. That's the uh, Lothar Günther Buchheim Museum, and this is the author of that novel. Later on, they made a film out of it, Das Boot, the submarine, right? And 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 Günther was a very sort of an um, uh, a. Uh, uh, a feisty guy and was uh, was not shy of pick, picking up some fights and uh, rumors say he did that with his client uh, Lothar Günther Buchheim. They had kind of a love and hate relationship. But we, uh, you know, we know from and you told me that Fry actually never really talked to you about his background in you know in the war and and stuff, right? Well, but very Günther, very little known about his participation in the war. Well, we yeah. know. He was only 17 years old at the time. And the thing that made an extremely strong impression was the cities burning below and the need for architects to do just the opposite. Exactly. And that's what united the similar um, you know, um, impression, very personal, is what Günther had, because he said, when I ever get out of this tin can, I make sure that no one is ever going to be trapped in space, right? So airiness, lightness, uh, transparency became basically a synonym for democracy and actually for both of them. And this is why they were such a good match on basically um, collaborating on uh, to participate in the competition for, and we go to the next slide, uh, the Olympics in Munich in 1972, right? And um, we, we have to say there's so much to talk about this project. Um, I actually took the top left picture, uh, which I wasn't supposed to do out of my sunroof of my quarter of a century young uh, micro Frank compact car Twingo that has, guess what, a vinyl roof. And it's, you know, it's still the first one. Our other pi mobile in back in Honolulu that DeSoto takes care of my old Mercedes has a fabric cloth. And that one, as you explained to us last time, doesn't last nearly as long. But also point out, Larry, the project at the very bottom right and the clear, uh, explain the, the similarities, but also the differences of the Olympics and the aviary in Munich as well. The aviary is a mesh. And when you make aviaries, you can make it uh, a different size mesh depending upon what's inside the aviary. But that one also is designed with a, a systems of support. So in some cases, they've been had openings where actually trees can pass through and things like that. And watch the, 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 the bare chested guy walking on it on the very top right. It's a little small, but we tell you there is someone walking on it because we want to get back to that as an, as an inspiration for the project we're currently collaborating on with the emerging generation, Larry. I want to quickly what go ahead. Don't realize is that they think fabric and mesh and stuff like that is really flimsy. But unless it's designed to be a flimsy mess, when it's pulled taut, it's it's like iron rods of steel. And so it's much easier to walk on it. It's not like it's, you're bouncing on a trampoline. Absolutely. And one project obviously has no enclosure or the netting is the enclosure. So the birds then get out. But the Olympics has a plexiglass enclosure. And Fry actually, uh, you know, uh, they say he actually liked the aviary more because it's more pure to that sort of agenda of doing the most with the least. On the Olympics, the executive engineer was actually Jörg Schleich. And, and Jörg Schleich, I can um, share with you, when we won the Expo 2000 train station project, which we did without an engineer in the competition for certain wrong, but at that point, legitimate reasons. When we won the competition, I sent out two letters uh, reaching to the stars, one to Arab and one to Jörg Schleich. And Jörg Schleich wrote me back and basically said, dear young architect, let me tell you, if I can be part of a project from the very beginning, I prefer that over to be brought in later and be your slave. It's something I didn't want to hear at that point, but I needed to hear. And Günther and he did it right. They worked on this from the very beginning. But Fry, being the critical guy and not afraid of speak up, uh, basically retrospectively found that the Olympics got a little bit too a little bit too heavy. 
And, um, th but there's so much to talk about it. And again, Larry, uh, you know so much about it. Let's do a separate show about this one. And for now, leave it with that. And now we wanna go back to your country and go to the next slide. And while, while Fry was working in his country uh, around the same time where he was so busy with the, with the, with the preparation for the Olympics, um, explain us what um, he had asked you to represent you guys in your country, Larry. Well, that was my, the first project I did in the States. That was the exhibition structure at the Museum of Modern Art first, and then it was transported to the uh, Ontario Art Museum in Canada, and then it was transported to the uh, Chicago Circle Campus of the University of Illinois. So it had a, a long life uh, of about 14 years, I believe. Yeah. And once amazing in, in this short amount of spirit of time, first doing the, you know, the World's Fair competition, doing the Olympics, being, I mean, you were the stars at that time. And down there it says, this is a quote from the exhibition catalog. This is really nice sort of um, uh, honorary, you know, text from this, um, from this journalist here. And at the bottom it says, among the many collaborators, who have worked with Fry Auto is Richard Larry Medlin, who designed the exhibition 10, right? And you told me that he turned to you and said, hey, Larry, let you do that because it's in your country and it's about your country, right? Right, and then uh, it was not only me, there was a bunch of collaborators who I involved my university students and we made it a process. The, the yeah. basic principle of this was to study going from a simple membrane like some you, you see in the upper row it was a simple saddle shape with slightly different configuration to a multiple saddle. So you could create dome shuttle volume shape spaces or linear tubes or whatever you needed to. And, and that you see uh, as a tension ring around the edge of it. And the, and the initial idea for that, it was intended to demonstrate the extension over the season. This is the summer and spring and fall version. And in the winter, it was to show how it could be winterized by putting literally, like you're talking about the pillow tubes above, so it would rub up against the underneath the skin from the tension ring that goes around, and then bring fabric drapes that would be scalloped around the perimeter to enclose the space so you could use it even during the winter and take advantage of its passive solar gain. Yeah. And speaking about climates, you mentioned the summer and going back to your native culture and country and climate, which is way less temperate and is way more extreme, right? So you dedicated your research, applied research, more than ever to the shading capacity of tensile structures. And up there is just a couple of them. And can you quickly walk us through them, maybe starting from top left? The top left is on the Wallapai Nation in the Grand Canyon. That's actually on the top of a ridge that extends out and going around that, what peninsula shaped ridge is 5,000 feet down is the Grand Canyon. And, and that's a, a, a simple saddle shaped membrane. In that case, it's oriented true north south and, and the edge on the south is raised so that in the winter, you'll get some sun in there and hit the, it serves as a visitor center for people who come to that uh, spot and the lot of sunlight to come there. And also what it does is in the summer, air moves up from the heat and it pivots through, but it creates a nice gentle breeze that goes by venturi action right through the middle of that membrane element. And that, that, that helps a lot in cooling that. I remember the first time I was there after it was finished was from standing out in the sunlight out, out in the edge in the bottom of the picture and going up to that area. It was, you made, it felt 15 or more degrees cooler. And then, so that, that's an example of a membrane structure where it, it's sort of freestanding from the adjacent uh, building elements. But then on the right, that's the zoo entry to the Tucson Zoo. And that's designed very specifically with the architecture 
of the complex that's there. It serves as the entry and ticket area for the Tucson Zoo. And it's a little bit difficult to see in that slide, but the, the, the entry building slopes down to the right and it drains and it, on the right edge of the picture, it drains into a garden that is to the west, uh, northwest of the pavilion or where the late summer sun is the worst in the evenings. So it irrigates vegetation there. And then in cases of times when there is no rain, which is frequent in Arizona, the membrane is slit, so it actually comes down. And then if you look very carefully on the lower right corner of that membrane, it drips rainwater off into the cistern. And that uh, collects cistern, and that can be used then to irrigate that same vegetation on times when it's really needed. Great. And talking water and cistern, there is another typology, the, the two other pictures on the right side. That, that, that's the Adaptive Recreation Center. That was a project by, it was Burns and Walt Hopkins architects at the time, now it's BWS. Well, well they, they actually did a design as architects for a, a, recre a recreation center that would house not only physical therapy, but public swimming sessions and so forth. And they designed a traditional building with all the pools indoors and the environmental control system required to condition that because of the humidity generated by the pools, just not, not pragmatic. And somebody asked them, why have all the pools inside? Why not cover them and leave some of them outdoors? And that's when they got me involved. And uh, they, they, we started conception over from the very beginning and said, well, what if we create a shade in there, it, it actually, in the abstract, it's like a giant umbrella. It's a big roof that will shade a large area. In the summer, it will go over the top and protect the more of the area directly beneath it. And, and then in the winter, a little bit of it will get back underneath the pavilion so you could, which in, throughout the year, you want to be able to have options between sun and shade. And that provides lots of area for that uh, in the winter. Uh, but not quite as much in the summer and it protects the area which which you want basically also uh the city was concerned about getting the biggest area they possibly could so we basically took in principle the simplest sort of structural concept which is three guys so the minimum number of guys the guy off the main mass and and then uh membranes that rises up from the edge so that warm air will rise up to the top in the winter as the you know, fan pushes some of it back down. In the summer, the vents are, are open and it's exhausted to the outside. Very good. And Larry, before we follow you further into your extended career in your home country through practice and uh, education and coaching. Let's stay a little bit in your in your other country in, in my native country, Germany, and, and go back and um, and just very quickly, we're also going to only do a little pre glimpse of it because we're going to dedicate another show to that to another fellow German who became a very close friend of yours. And we're on that slide now. That's Conrad Waxman, who was an original member of the Bauhaus. And he uh, was good friends with uh, Walter Gropius. He actually he escaped Germany in the World War and he went to uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts and he actually lived in Walter Gropius' basement where they did some work drawings and the exhibit material for a general panel house, the working drawings of which were exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in a recent, well, not a recent, an exhibit about five or six years ago. And then he also was, uh, he uh, went, he read it in the newspaper that, that Albert Einstein had won a medal for his work in energy and that the city of Potsdam had awarded him a 
uh, prize of a house to be built in Potsdam. And so he was literally coming on the train from Munich, from Berlin going to Munich. He get, turned around on the train, went back to Berlin, and then went, he knew where the, the Einstein's apartment was. Back then you could just look up addresses. And he went up there and he came to the door and, and introduced himself. My name is Conrad Waxman. I'm the architect who's going to design the, house, the, the right. Einstein house for Potsdam. And uh, the, the, the care person was there at the door and said, I, nobody's been hired for that. But Mrs. Einstein heard him talking in the background and came to the door and they started having a conversation. And he told her he, he had some ideas for that and he'd like to talk to them about uh, how they could approach that and how it could be meaningful in many dimensions and what you did there. And so she invited him in. And as the conversation pursued, she said, he said, do you want to go out and look at the site in Potsdam? And she said, sure, just bring up the car and we'll go, thinking that there's no way in post-World War Berlin you have access to a car. But Conrad Maxman, a clever guy, had a Mercedes touring car. He went over to the window where he parked it below, pointed it out to her, and then they went out for a tour. And then they toured the site and came back and she talked to Albert and this is the right guy to be the architect. And then they became fast friends after that. Yeah, and so you became with uh, Conrad and we want to talk about that in a separate show. And you were really, really close. One of the things I remember from you telling me is that he asked you to teach his kids the birds and the bees, for example, that's as close as you guys were. And we talking trained, we had the chance, Larry, to go to Conrad's roots as some years ago in 2014 when you were visiting. And this is east of Dresden, close to the Polish and the Czech border. And there's a separate show about it. If you guys want to look this up from the old Urban Transcendence Day that you see a show quote up there from the very top right. So that was interesting because that's where he worked for the firm Christoph and Unmark. And it was right before what you just told him when he met, you know, Albert Einstein, which is obviously fostering his career, right? And so, but let's go to the next slide and, and quickly, um, you know, make the connection again to, to Fry Otto because Conrad was also known, you know, for many other things. And there is this space frame project he did for the Air Force, right? He projected, which was unfortunately never yeah. built nor were his prefab houses that he projected with Gropius, but he got many other things accomplished, right? But so, you know, they were both also large scale kind of space frame guys. At, at this point in 2014, Larry, when, we, when you departed from us and said goodbye, I, I wish I would have asked you more or you would have told me more where you moved on to after that. And where was that? Uh, after... I'm sorry, I don't quite understand. After after we were in Niski together and, and looked at, at Conrad's early work and you said goodbye and you kept traveling on in, 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 in Germany. I, I went I went to Stuttgart and I knew that Triato was uh, ill and they probably didn't have much longer to live. And I went, that's him and his atelier there and, and the, which is just at the bottom of the hill from his house in Moambron. And you know, Ingrid, his wife, told me that uh, you know he's not in a very good health, maybe about a 20 minute visit. And we ended up talking three and a half hours. It was unbelievable. We, and what we talked about was things that he, he accomplished, what was good, what he still wanted to accomplish, and wish he had time to, to do. And then we also spent a lot of time like uh, reminiscing about the projects in uh, Montreal and, and, the, 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 and particularly the personalities of some of the French Canadian contractors that worked in building that and their ingenuity and how important it is to have that sort of collaboration between the builders and the architects and the constructors and set that process up as, hopefully as, as, as soon as possible. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. you see, we put in a picture of the young Fry in his atelier in Bonbon on, on the right. And at the very bottom left, very important, Larry, um, the Pritzker Prize jury was already in preparation to make him the, the finalist nominee for the Pritzker Prize, right? And that's correct. He, and he still witnessed the process and he, 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 he was, you know, sure he could, that, he, that, he, that he could get it. And then it was, it was awarded to him very close to him passing away, right? And they announced it the, the next day, mm -hmm. exactly. which was earlier than the normal time they would have done that. Yeah. So what, what, what great, you know, uh, chance that, that you guys had, uh, you know, took the opportunity and you took the opportunity to, to visit him one more time and to reconvene and, you know, talk, you know, for hours and hours. And then you said, you know, when, when you were basically leaving, uh, Ingrid and him came, right, and, and waved goodbye. They, and they, just... walked, they left the building and walked, at, 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 which is not the easiest test, down the stairs and to the street and stood at the curbside as we left and, and waved goodbye to us. It was, it was a very emotional moment. I can only imagine, Larry. And maybe that being the case, maybe we uh, make a cut here and leave, you know, this moment, leave, leave the show and leave, um, the, you know, for today and uh, only to continue uh, in the next couple of shows. Uh, once again, following, um, you know, Fry for a little bit longer, but then basically following you, as said, through your professional and academic career. Uh, which is currently, uh, you know, very interesting to us anyways, but also just as Fry's work has never gone out of style or fashion, um, we're currently, again, heavily inspired by you guys' work and happy to have you on board and on the team for some different ways to live in our paradise of Hawaii. So thank you, Larry, for sharing with us these fascinating stories and uh, we're taking a little break um, uh, next week. Uh, you have some personal private obligations to take care of, but we're gonna reconvene in about two weeks with the uh, volume six, I guess it is already. So look forward to that, Larry. Thank you, Martin. I'll look forward to seeing you then. Me too. And see you all back then. Bye-bye.